we are continuing this series called The Dandelion Effect. And The Dandelion Effect is really all about um, uh, what we, we envision uh, God wants us to be about as a church. And I shared last week that over the course of several months, we tried to answer the question several of us gathered to try and talk about to answer the question, uh, why do we do what we do? And um, in particular, last week, if you were with us, uh, I talked about this thing called mission. And um, what I shared was this. I said, because of Jesus' mission, we will live on mission here at Ferndale by engaging our communities, by sharing God's transforming love. And uh, folks, what is really, really important, what's really critical to remember is this statement that I just shared with you. It's a mission statement. And it's kind of this really broad, general, overarching, it's, it's kind of this idea of what we hope, what we hope to accomplish as a church. And that said, kind of the, the next step was really kind of the breakdown to get very specific with what we believe God's kind of given us to do here at FFMC as a vision. In other words, just so that we're really clear on this idea, vision, vision is an effort to describe what long-term goals and what we want to look like in the future. So this is just to kind of break it down and to try and get as specific as we possibly can. Because see, helping, helping us understand our purpose is key to helping us really have an impact on the world. But just as we did last week, I want to think very, very purposefully and carefully about Jesus' vision. What his ideas, what his specific plans were. That he wanted his church to be composed of disciples who look like, act like, think like, and love like Jesus. So before we get any further, let me just stop for a moment. Let's just pray together. Would you pray with me? God, this morning as we continue to consider what you have called us to do and to be, God, we pray that you would speak to us individually as well. God, we've kind of got this general idea, these overarching ideas, but God, you also have something very specific for each of us to be and to do. Lord, we all have influence beyond what we might imagine that we do. The people that come in and out of our lives every day in different ways, in different places, different settings. And God, may we today May we receive kind of this invigorated idea and refreshment, Lord, of what it is that you would have us to do, what it is you would have us to be. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. You know, Pastor Bryce read from Acts chapter 1 today. I think that that's pretty clearly what Jesus' vision is. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. What we heard today was this, that in a former book, Luke writes to his friend Theopolis. He wrote that all that Jesus began to do and to teach, right up until the time that Jesus was taken to heaven, right up until the very moment. And that at that point, though, he gave some instructions through the Holy Spirit to those who uh, he called apostles, those he was going to send out into the world. And then, as part of that story, Jesus, was, Jesus suffered. He presented himself to them. He gave all these convincing proofs that he actually had risen from the dead. Actually, he did this over a period of 40 days, we read. 
and he talked about this kingdom of God. And then on, there was a specific occasion that Luke mentioned that he was eating with them and he gave them a very, very specific command. This is what he said. He said, do not leave Jerusalem, but actually I want you to wait here. I want you to wait for the gift my father has promised. And you've heard me talk about this gift. He said, that John, he baptized with water for a few days. Hence, you are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so then they came around Jesus, all the disciples, and they thought, this is it. This is the time. So this is when you're going to make the nation of Israel rulers of the world, right? And Jesus said this. He says, not for you know the times or the dates that the Father has set for by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Friends, our desire here is we want to be like dandelion seeds. I know that sounds a little odd, but we want to be like dandelion seeds because dandelion seeds, if you didn't know it, they can be carried up to half a mile from where they grow. And when they manage to touch down, do you know what dandelion seeds begin to do? They begin to grow more dandelions. They start the process all over, and they do this again and again and again, over and over and over. And we want to kind of be a church that has that kind of impact, that kind of dandelion effect. And here, because of Jesus' vision, we will live that vision out here at Ferndale. We want to reach diverse generations with a life-changing news of Jesus. We sense, we believe that we're called to reach people who live in Ferndale, Hazel Park, Royal Oak, all over our region, around the world, and that we're going to flourish. We want to flourish and experience the transforming power of Jesus. Now, the question is, where do you begin? Where do you start I'm always going to fall back to this. I want to start where Jesus started. And I think Jesus started by telling us that there would be power that would come to us from the Holy Spirit. When he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And through this vision, we believe that power will enable us to reach diverse generations with the life-changing news of Jesus. Now, the truth is, when you read that passage from Acts, the disciples, their real interest at that point is they want to claw back earthly power from the Roman occupiers. They're not really concerned about anything else. And what Jesus is doing is he's redirecting the disciples, trying to help them understand, to, to see that there's much more to his vision becoming reality than just raw power. As a matter of fact, the author of Acts, Dr. Luke, Luke, he really stresses that particular point in his gospel as it comes to a close in Luke chapter 27, verses 47 through 49. And Jesus speaks to his disciples about the importance of understanding that the, forget, that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name, to all nations. It's going to begin in Jerusalem. He says, you are to be witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power on high. See, there's also an underlying directive that comes from Jesus as it relates to this whole idea of fulfilling his vision. And it's quite simply this. And you may have it may have gone right by you. You may have slipped up on this. You may not have seen it, but it's in this passage. Jesus says, stay. He says, pause. He says, 
wait. And I've often wondered why the disciples are told to wait. Why not just get up and get going, do it right now. Make it happen now. And even for us here at Ferndale, why don't we just get up and just go right now and make it happen? Why don't we just make this reaching of diverse generations with a life-changing message of news and of Jesus happen right now? Part of me wonders if the reason we're told we need to wait is because it's an opportunity to learn, to learn what it means to wait in a way that demonstrates without question we know where the power we're supposed to be receiving truly comes from. Look, when most of us hear the word wait, something usually trips inside of us. Things like impatience, complaining, exasperation, they well up, they rise up in each of us. The truth is waiting in the right way it can actually form us, it can shape us, so that when we are actually empowered by God's Spirit, the impact that we have is immeasurable. I don't think there's any accident that the words from the prophet Isaiah and Isaiah 40 read this word way. Those who hope in the Lord, that's one way of saying that verse. Have you ever heard the phrase, those who wait on the Lord? This is the same passage. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. These words come right before the words from Isaiah 43, 19, where God explains, see, now I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So a question in my mind becomes as we chase this, this vision of reaching diverse nations or diverse generations with the life-changing news of Jesus, precisely might what that look like? Are, are we really ready to do that? Do we know what it means to relate to or to reach someone else who comes from an exceptionally different or, or diverse background? There is a Christian pastor by the name of Dan Meyer. This idea of reaching people who are different, who are diverse, he calls it being otherward focus. He says that there are these six different categories of what it means to be otherward focused. This is what he says. If we are otherwards or if we are outward focused, we become outgoing. We become treasure seekers. That means we're looking for hidden gems in the lives of other people. We're hospitable. We're empathetic. We're resourceful. We're self-sacrificing. And when you stop and you think about it, it makes sense that we want to be this people who share about the life-changing news of the one who sacrificed himself for you and for me. So this idea of power coming from the Holy Spirit, fueling this vision, reaching diverse generations with the life-changing news of Jesus. There's something else that comes from the vision of Jesus. Here in our context, here in Ferndale, that calls to us, it encourages us to be witnesses in proximity. Jesus said to his disciples, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the, the earth. And so this vision that we believe God has called us to act upon. It's about reaching diverse generations with the life-changing news of Jesus. And we're called to reach those who live in Ferndale and Hazel Park, Royal Oak, our region, and across the world. In reading about this vision of Jesus, 
I think it's really easy to skip over the fact that Jesus mentions the city of Jerusalem first. In the Gospel of Luke, just like in this account from the book of Acts, which again was written by Luke, one writer puts it this way. He says, Jerusalem was central. From the temple scenes that we read about when Jesus was an infant to the long journey to Jerusalem that goes from Luke chapter 9 all the way to Luke chapter 19 to this deep passion that Jesus had around this city that was known to kill its prophets. And the story that led to Jerusalem, the story of the church, led from Jerusalem. There's importance, there's critical importance in learning how to witness in proximity. In a similar way, Jesus starts with Jerusalem. I think it's quite normal that we would start with Ferndale. We, we sang a song this morning called, You're the God of this city. You're the king of these people. You're the Lord of this nation. Do, do, we, really, do we really believe that? Or are we just singing that because the words are up there? I distinctly remember feeling angry about the messages. I kept hearing over and over during my undergrad days, I'm at a Christian college that I attended. It seemed that the way you knew you were truly and committed, uh, sold out to do the will of God, was if you committed to take the gospel to people over there, to the unreached peoples of the deep, dark, whatever, land, continent. All I could think about was... What about the people here? I mean, aren't there a bunch of people in places like Chicago and New York, Los Angeles, Peru, Indiana, uh, Litchfield, Illinois, Cadillac, Michigan, that need to be reached? It felt, I felt like the quiet part that wasn't being said out loud was that people in those places that I just mentioned were beyond being reached. That those people were a lost cause. And that the real place where the witness of the church and the word of God would have an impact was over there. Well, this passage, this vision of Jesus, from Acts chapter 1, it's clear that sharing the good news about who Jesus is and about what Jesus has done can be done right where we are, right here, and right now. I want to ask you a couple of simple things about our city, about Ferndale. These are things that I, I'm going to tell you. I did not know these until I decided that it was important enough to really know about it and that I wanted to share it with you. I'd like to see what we know about our, our own version of Jerusalem, Ferndale, okay? So here's my first question. Does anybody know who the original inhabitants of this region were? It was an indigenous people. Does anybody know who they were? Anybody? Close, very close. Close again. It's the Lumi Nation. The Lumi Nation were some of the first inhabitants, particularly of this part of the region. But the Potawatomi were, um, they're they're also uh, uh, another indigenous group of people. Let me ask another question. This is a little bit more up to date. Does anybody know the name of our mayor, Ferndale? If you think you know, just kind of raise your hand. If If you don't, that's okay. If you think you know, raise your hand. Okay. All right. That's okay. Because again, this is something that I was not aware of either. Name of our mayor? Her name is Raylan Meeks. Raylan Raylan Leeks, I'm sorry. Raylan Leeks May. Actually, she showed up at our door last spring asking if I had any questions about the city. Just wanted to introduce herself. 
What else do we know? What else do we know about this area that we live in? Much like Jesus told his disciples they would be witnesses in areas that were in close proximity to Jerusalem. Remember, Judea and Samaria. What about Hazel Park? What about Royal Oak? What about other regions of our immediate world? How well do we know our neighborhoods, our villages, our towns? And as we desire to see this vision turn into action for all of us here, the call is to reach out to folks who, whose proximity, their, their closeness to us, it really provides this incredible opportunity to share this life-changing news of Jesus Christ. Friends, our reach really isn't limited, nor is our impact. So we know that power and the Holy Spirit, they're going to fuel our vision for reaching diverse generations with this life-changing news of Jesus. Additionally, um, we have uh, this uh, power and the Holy Spirit fueling um, our vision to reach diverse generations. We know uh, that we want to witness in proximity. We want to not be unaware of who is around us, their stories, getting to know them. But why do we want to do that? What Ultimately, what, what, are we, what are we hoping to accomplish? Ultimately, it's this. Quite simply, we want to see people have changed lives. We want them to flourish and experience the transforming power of life in Jesus. So now, let me get real specific, though. What does a changed life, what, what are we talking about? We talk about changed lives. Are we, are we talking about becoming a church that preaches this health and wealth, good news? Are we talking about becoming a church that's known as a group of self-righteous people where we're the only ones who are right, everyone else is wrong? No, not at all. That's, that's not our heart. No, we're talking about becoming a church with an eye on what God has planned for all of his creation from the beginning of creation. Lives. We want to see lives that flourish in the way that he intended for them to. Amy Sherman, she has a book called Agents of Flourishing. And she wrote about the marks of an authentic or true flourishing that takes place in a life. The first thing she said is there's communion with God. Actually, Psalm 27, 13, where the psalmist writes these words, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. A second mark of flourishing is beauty and creativity that will be a people who celebrate that everyone is made in the image of God. Third, there is this learning and discovering. There, there are marks of what it means to flourish. We're designed, we are made to display curiosity and intelligence. We are supposed to ask questions like, I wonder, help me understand. What's going on in your life? How can I be of encouragement to you in your life? A fourth mark of authentic flourishing is wholeness. And just like in the Garden of Eden, we experience this. We're told again that in the New Jerusalem, uh, that's we're told about in the New Testament. We'll experience freedom. There won't be disease. There won't be depression. There won't be distress. There's a fifth mark of a flourishing community. That's unity and diversity. Celebrating our God. We will be a people from every race, nation, and tribe. And there'll be this incredible peace. No more striving. Finally, as we look to be a place that encourages this flourishing of lives. There'll be prosperity or even better, abundance. The idea here being one of God's creation of bounty. And this is the kind of flourishing that we want realized in the lives of those we are being called to reach. I mentioned this last week, but it's well worth mentioning again. Folks, 
it is exceptionally easy. Actually, it doesn't take much work at all to complain about how bad people are. That um, so many folks are, you know, they're living outside of the lines. And that's why we are in such a mess as a people or as a nation or as a church. But consider this as we explore what it means to be a church interested in seeing lives changed in Jesus' name. Think about this. Conforming to boundary markers, friends, that too often is a substitute for authentic transformation. Make sure you caught what I just said. Making people conform to boundaries, that's a substitution for real life transformation. Let me give you an example. Pastor John Orberg said this. He said, the church I grew up in had its boundary markers. A prideful or resentful pastor could have kept his job, but if the pastor was ever caught smoking a cigarette, oh, he'd have been fired. Not because anyone in the church actually thought smoking, a, smoking was a worse sin than pride or resentment, but because smoking defined who was in our subculture and who wasn't. It was a boundary marker. He continues, he says, as I was growing up, having a quiet time, became a boundary marker, a measure of spiritual growth. If someone had asked me about my spiritual life, I would immediately think, oh, have I been having regular and lengthy quiet times? My initial thought was not, am I growing more loving toward God and to others? Boundary markers, they change from culture to culture, but the dynamic remains the same. If people don't experience authentic transformation, then their faith will deteriorate into a search for boundary markers that masquerade as evidence of a changed life. I think something to remember as we dream and of being and setting out to become this church where people flourish and experience the transforming power of life in Jesus. Friends, we are not alone in this. There are others. There are others who want to see our community become authentically healthy, a vibrant place. But we must realize that there certainly are others in this community and in other communities that we specifically mentioned, Hazel Park, Royal Oak, our region, even the world. They want nothing more. They, they, they want the same thing. They want to see the unhoused housed. They want to see addicts freed from addictions. They want to see children, all the elderly, all provided for. They too want parks <laughs> that they can play in, streets and neighborhoods that are safe for everyone. Believe me, believe me, there will be opportunities that come to us where we get to link arms. For example, I don't know if you caught it, but Kelly mentioned it this morning. Trick or treat. It's an opportunity to partner with others in our community. Give out candy. Of course, who doesn't like giving out candy? It's also an opportunity in a very practical way to share the love of Jesus with other people who want to do the same thing, who want to see lives changed and flourish. I think that reflects something that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 25. When he said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. <sighs> Who knows? Who knows? Perhaps, perhaps when we authentically live these things out, all the complaining about how bad people are, the concerns for how folks are living outside of the lines, the observations about and why we are in such a mess as a people or a nation or a church. Perhaps we will begin to have the kind of influence on those around us that truly leads to this kind of deep, 
authentic transformation that previously we were only complaining about. There is a, a book that was written by a Christian astronomer. His name was Dr. David Broadstreet. The book's called Starstruck. He said this, Our planet is home to some 10 to 14 million species of living things. He said this, he says, Consider the lowly dandelion found on all the Earth's continents. Did you know that? I don't know if there's dandelions on Antarctica, but maybe, I don't know. But he says they're found on all the Earth's continents. And he says these tenacious plants seem to flourish anywhere and everywhere, particularly where there are fussy gardeners wishing they wouldn't. And speaking of gardening, I don't know if you noticed around the church, but there was a group of people who were here yesterday. And they did a smash-up, bang-up job taking care of this part of God's creation. Dandelion flower heads are perfectly designed for maximum seed creation and dispersal. Each yellow flowering head can disperse 50 to 175 seeds to the wind. One single dandelion plant can create more than 2,000 seeds. Think about it. Think about that describing the work, the ministry of the church. Not just of any church, of this church. Because of Jesus' vision, we want to live that vision here at Ferndale. And just as dandelion seeds are carried by the wind up to half a mile from where they've grown, whereupon they grow new dandelions, they start the process all over again. We want to be a church. We want to be a church of dandelion effect. We will reach diverse generations with the life-changing news of Jesus We sense this call to reach those who live in Ferndale, Hazel Park, Royal Oak, our region, and the world. We will flourish and experience the transforming power of life in Jesus. Is it going to be easy? Ask the disciples. Was it easy for them? When we make mistakes, ask the disciples. Those people were boneheads. <laughs> Didn't matter. They were empowered by Jesus, the Holy Spirit. They changed the world. Friends, I'd love to be a world changer and the place to start right here. Pray with me, would you? God, do we have all the answers for how this will all come to pass? No, but we believe that you are leading us, that you are directing us, that you are fueling us. And God, are we going to make mistakes along the way? <laughs> A ton. Will there be people who will be drawn to us while others maybe not? Absolutely. God, more than anything though, may we be changed. May we develop this deep desire. May it grow in us that we would just love other people like you love people. Lord, when that happens, Lord, these transforming seeds of your truth and impact of your word. Lord, it is unstoppable. It is indeed unstoppable. 
Now, God, it's a big task, but you're a huge God. May we submit ourselves to your word, to your will, and your way as we seek to be the people, your church, in the way that you've called us to be your people, recognizing that this is your church. We pray this in the name of the one who has shown us the way forward, Jesus. Amen. Amen.